Hello everyone, welcome to Song and Beyond, cooperation of the Hamsam Foundation with iDodger.com Live, the place where classical music happens. It's Tuesday, so it's more about songs. Uh, tonight we're going to do a rebroadcast of a conversation from last summer, like we did last week as well. These are conversations we broadcast last uh, June, the webinar webinars with the Hamsam Foundation and the University of Michigan in a series called Art of Democracy. Uh, this conversation tonight is um, with Mark Clegg and myself in conversation with Caroline Helton of University of Michigan and Stephen Emery of St. Olaf's College. And we are going to talk with them about their research on the performance of music by black composers sung by singers of all ethnic origins which is quite a fascinating conversation. We're also going to be joined by uh, two colleagues, uh, I believe students, in fact, of these uh, professors, Kaswana Kayinda and, and Stephen Lancaster. So please enjoy the show. I'll see you live. And as you can see from a different corner of the world, but I'll tell you all about that next week. Have a good time. Welcome to the Hamsung Foundation Facebook page live, as well as the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance. This is the third in our series of the Art of Democracy, which is a program that we have instituted together under our Classical Song Research Initiative cooperation between the Hamsung Foundation and the University of Michigan, uh, represented tonight by the illustrious, the one and only, the incredible Dr. Mark Clegg, how are you, Mark? It's good to see you. Great, tonight. great, Thomas. It's wonderful to be here for our third conversation, where I think we're really going to get into some some interesting issues about how arts can really serve as a bridge for communication and understanding. Um, I think one of the phrases I think about a lot is this notion of arts for art's sake, which we talk about, and you know that's a great catchphrase, and I think it shows that art has a certain purity and a you know functions in its own realm. But really, for me, art. If it were just about art's sake, it wouldn't be that interesting, right? I mean, it's it's really art for life's sake that I think we're exploring in this Art of Democracy series. And and this is going to be a great show to talk about the way in which art helps us live our life. And our initiative, our cooperation is is all about, what is it all about? It's all about education, obviously, but it is all about the study and understanding of how the story and narrative of so many can be about all of us at the same time. It is, without question, the power of poetry and music, especially built as its own art form, informs not only the performer, but the listener to a new understanding of their own life and their own story in a multicultural, multilingual world. Uh, well, we'll get into that in some kind of detail. I, obviously, by the by the title of tonight's show, which is Breaking Down Barriers, or I may have got that wrong. Have I got that wrong? Singing Down the Barriers. Down. Singing Down the Barriers. Well, even better. <laughs> Apropos, why don't I just introduce the people that you're looking at here and get myself out of the screen here. Stephen Lancaster. I'm going to go right across the top of my screen. Stephen Lancaster, welcome this evening. Emery Stevens, I'm going to do it exactly opposite them. It sounds like I'm being consistent. We have Mark Clegg. Now I'll do the ladies. We have a wonderful, uh, Stephen is a singer as well. Well, you're all singers, never mind. Kaswana Kanyida Kanyinda. I will get that right before the evening's out. Wonderful mezzo. Caroline Hil Helton and Emery have done uh, wonderful workshops and programs around the country uh, for the Hamsung Foundation in the idea of teaching teachers how to cross-disciplinary teach their different disciplines through the power of poetry and music. And we'll talk about that more, more as well. To kick this whole thing off, we stumbled onto, we were looking for, for some kicker points in our first presentation. And we came up with three rhetorical questions and they work really well as a point of departure. Uh, and I know that Caroline, you and Emery really have the, <clears throat> the lead on this evening's program. So the first question, how did and do works of art directly participate in social and political discourse, especially social change in America, American democracy? That is, of course, the million dollar question. Second one, how does art, as it were, offer a safe space or even an unsafe space to explore social and political topics that otherwise are too polarizing to address? 
that's some good information about the arts and humanities. And the third question is, what role have the arts played or do the arts play today in the lives of diverse, with a capital D, Americans? And can their social or political views change as a result of engaging with art? Now, if I may, we, this word art, my take on the word art is a kind of stopping of time. To, to have art to me is a, is a verb and it creates an artifact. And that artifact is a signpost on a journey. And to just be into the art of the art of it doesn't particularly interest me. The art informs me in my journey because somebody's put there a signpost of what that life, what that meaning in, in our lives or in a collective life meant at that particular time. And I get to stop. I, said, I love that about songs. I think, was John, I think it was John Juke who said there's, that a song was a, a willful suspension of time for three to four minutes where you could have a, a more interesting interior dialogue with yourself. Uh, and and who it is and what it is to be alive and that's to me what this word art means. That's all I want to say. Who's going to take the lead? Go, Caroline, please. While your internet is working, go. <laughs> Start yeah. us on our journey this evening. Well, to me, the art of democracy draws its power from the fact that we listen to a voice, an individual. We create a relationship with the poet and the music, and we learn from that mm -hmm. interpersonal connection. And then we can be moved to action through empathy with that individual. And action through empathy, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's just a, <laughs> that's just a wonderful phrase. Oh, good for you, action through empathy. Oh my and that's, Lord. And that's our project. Uh, I And the other thing is we have, we hear a lot of stuff around us. In fact, uh, we as white Americans have heard the invitations from our fellow Americans, from black Americans for a long time to be part of this journey. But have we really listened? You know, so now is an opportunity to listen uh, to the invitations that are around you and then move forward as a as a cohort of people, because that's the other thing that the, that singing does is we sing together. It creates community. Um, enslaved Americans created community with their song. We can create a community with this song and and bind our bind our society together. Emery, I see you shaking your head. Yes, in, in agreement. Uh, as musicians, I know our thing is to listen, right? And also to embody what we're singing about. And so through our collective and individual histories, I think this is where the art of democracy or just looking at music as a vehicle, as a lens into someone else's experience that could be your own or maybe different but there's some preparation for you to do the work as any singer approaching any genre of music. You want to find out the cultural history. And I think this, in terms of this, even the series, having this conversation is very helpful for, uh, for myself, but also for others listening, because I think this is what we need to do. We need to have the conversations Uh, we have to have those hard conversations as well um, through music. And I think this is an opportunity to, to do it through music in a wonderful way. So, so well, you. Emery, yeah. can, you, can you tell us yeah. a little bit more about your project? Sure. Well, uh, it all started at the University of Michigan. I guess I'm getting a plug here, right? Maize and blue. <laughs> University, of, University of what? What? <laughs> Michigan! <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm a proud visiting artist, I can, I can cheer on here. You can cheer on. You're an honorary member. <laughs> well, it all started in 2004. I was a doctoral student at the University of Michigan, and um, I was in a seminar uh, that was taught by Caroline Helton. 
And I had, um, everyone was doing presentations. I was the only black student in the class. And I was doing a presentation on the performance practice of spirituals. And I sort of concluded my presentation by inviting my colleagues to perhaps study the songs or to study them enough to teach others or also to even program them on their own recitals. And the halting reply from my colleagues was, we can't because we're not black. Uh -huh. So this put me into terms of is music about being black, white? You know, is it beyond that? What are some of the barriers? What are some of the things that are people are thinking about this music inhabiting one space? And so this sort of allowed me to sort of start thinking about, okay, maybe there should, should be some sort of survey. So I did uh, create an African-American arts survey that I sent out to about 240 uh, teachers, students, and coaches, and um, it was revealing in a lot of ways in terms of people's perceptions, feeling like they don't want to offend people by the repertoire, not knowing where to go to find sort of collections of this music. And then some people talking about sort of histories of minstrelsy. Exactly. There you go, Caroline. And so anyway, I, I partnered with Caroline Helton because I thought, well, she's already in this doctoral seminar. It all started there. And it would be a great way to, to show folks that African Americans and also non can approach and should sing this repertoire. I think if we don't, if we don't, right, I mean, in terms of if there's no demand in the publishers of this music, a lot of these things would be back ordered. And so we need to really thrust forward. Caroline? Well, oh, and what, what yeah, is I was the most interesting? Before, 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 go ahead. I'm oh, sorry, Thomas. I was, one of the most interesting aspects of the survey that Emory did was to find that the barriers to singing this repertoire didn't, came from all sides. It, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot to unpack. And so if you can have a conversation about all of these barriers in a diverse group of singers, then you have a chance to understand this whole complicated picture. Mm -hmm. And if I can add as someone who has seen the, the Caroline and Emery do their amazing residency and work at the University of Notre Dame, I think one of the things that our singers and teachers came away with was we were both amazed at what was possible when people would just dialogue and really talk about their lived experiences, but also it was wonderful to hear from Black singers and, and, and Emory as well, how, you know, we view one of the racist ways that white people view Black people as sort of as a monolith. It's like a society, but they, white people don't view themselves as a monolith. And then when you hear the lived experiences of black singers that say, I don't fully identify with this particular music, you know, and, and hearing their unique lives and their unique perspectives, you realize, you know, wait, there's a whole lot that we can talk about as individuals and share with each other um, and begin to see each other as more than black and white, but also really understand what's going on with the systemic racism and why it's, it's a deal here. Kaswan, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it to you in a minute, but I want to just jump in here, not anecdotally, but what to me is so passionately important in all of this is exactly what you two are saying, and that is everybody should be singing our American stories. It's American song. And yes, it has different cultural roots, if you will, or heritages or connectivities. Yes, the symbols can be this or that. But in fact, you know, Langston Hughes is my poet. He's an American poet, full stop. Margaret Bonds is an American composer, full stop. Yes, she's also a woman. Oh my God, what does that sound like? Well, in fact, she's a black woman. Oh my God, Lord in heaven, what can that also be? You know, this stuff got to stop. And Kaswana, you have so much to say about this, go. Um, so. Uh, my perspective as a young uh, Black uh, artist that has taken the class um, was just life-changing for me. Um, it was 
being in a space and being an opera in itself has been really challenging because you're trying to find ways to connect to the music, but you're not mm -hmm. used to search some of the like cultural nuances that are within the music, you know, from people who, when majority of my life I've listened to like hip hop, R&B and jazz, those are the type of, mu that's the type of music I listen to. So to find music that um, still fits in like the classical realm and, but is from people that look like me and speaks to an experience that I know very well and it just helped to validate me and anchor me in being a classical singer. Um, and that's why I enjoyed the class so well. And I think once I was able to anchor myself in that knowledge, it was easier for me to connect with other branches of classical music. Like similar, like once I um, had that, I started to gravitate a lot towards Russian art song. Um, English art song was, you know, a little bit easier and Italian art song. And it was just easier for me to kind of, I guess you could say explore, knowing that there was always gonna be something there for me um, to come back to. We are going to hear you sing. Beautiful song. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful yeah. song. So active. Who is, this, who is this woman Boykin? She's fantastic. Um, she was actually the first um, first female contestant of the composer division in the George Shirley vocal competition. Um, and she has a whole collection of songs by Michael Angelou, um, poetry, more of her shorter poems. Um, and it makes up a song cycle called Moments in Sonder. Um, she's written a, a couple more choral works as well. Um, her, um, she's got a couple of contemporaries such as Brandon Spencer, Marcus Garrett, um, Jarrell Gray. Um, and I've just been working with Vidamus's uh, George Shirley vocal competition for a while um, under Dr. Louise Toppin and just having that experience to know that this music is still made and still being kept alive has just been so so honoring and inspiring um and to know in times like these there are people out there with pens and music paper just ready to write the and immortalize these experiences that we're living through now well put mark well i'm just wondering because how this particular song i mean you, you spoke so movingly about how connecting with the song and connecting yourself to the music had opened up an aesthetic and an expressive realm for you. So I wonder if you can talk about this particular piece. I mean, it's what I love about it is the, the kind of active force, the, the power that's coming through that's sort of defeating doubt and fear. 
mm -hmm. you know, that's there. So there's a personal message that I think could apply to to many, many different people, you know. Right. Um, but there's also a way that, that having a black poet and a black composer as a black artist, mm -hmm. I, it sounds like you were saying that this, this was really meaningful for you personally. And I wonder if you could just connect your previous statement to this specific song. Right. Um, so this specific song, um, my interpretation of it was basically in the vein of a black woman. And when she is approaching someone she loves, or, or she's infatuated with someone and just reveling in that feeling. Um, I can say um, there's, there is most of the poetry that I've come in contact with in African-American music kind of stems from more of like a, I, I'll still say it stems from a man's perspective. I haven't really seen a lot um, from a specifically a black woman's perspective. So to have that moment in time that speaks about, you know, like that, that vein of femininity and, and just that feeling of, of validity, you know, that comes with, you know, knowing that you feel a certain way and that person feels the same way about you and you can see it on their face. Sometimes they don't have to tell you, but you can just see it on their face. Um, and that's kind of how I came to that conclusion. Um, also just this particular piece in an, and I'd say it in another vein, um, just the, the music in itself kind of lends, how should I say, the poetry is, is really, really um, expressive in the fact that it, it also can relate itself to the how can I say like the 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 sense of validity with just specific familiarity and and going helping to propel you into things that are not as you know sure or not as uh, solid um, and just having having music to me helps me to propel myself into other areas of my life. That reminds well, me of well, Caroline's point about empathy earlier. Yeah, Yeah. yeah exactly. What I, what I love about a performance like yours or, or a piece like this is it invites everyone into that space for themselves. Right. It's, it's, they're singing it themselves. Right. That's how I feel very mostly when I sing songs is I'm making something far more interesting than I am myself audible. Mm -hmm. And I want people to go to that island of, of gorgeous beauty or pain or whatever it might be mm -hmm. uh, and, and inhabit that from it, embrace that. It's, it's their poem for that moment. It's their musical language. And, and it's, for us to do that as performers, it's incredibly important to identify with it, to understand. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to be ours, but if you can, it's fine. You, I mean, Stephen, I see you're shaking your head a lot. Have you, been, have you found that to be true in your own performances? Absolutely. I think, I mean, what is so amazing about art songs is it's, you can't get much more intimate as an art form. And really, I think as humans, our deepest emotions come alive and are felt in those intimate moments, either as individuals alone or with our loved ones. And so to experience and watch and listen, um, to someone singing that intimate moment, it's so much easier for us to empathize with it and to get into it. And I agree, as a singer, you to really understand a song, you have to begin to, to identify with it in your own way or enter into the character. Mm -hmm. And that helps you become uh, what we focus on now is a very, very important aspect of the singer, the performer, empathizing with the voices of the poet and the composer, and the uh, and the. But I want us to now think about the power of our example as we stand up on stage and proclaim the voice of the character that we are inhabiting and what that does to audiences. 
um, like, you know, we don't know things are possible until we see the brave person that stands up and proclaims this, this individual. Um, and so uh, leading by example, walking the walk is, is a thousand times more effective than just lecturing people about it. Emery, you just sit there shaking your head. I certainly, I certainly agree. <laughs> I certainly agree with Caroline and with Stephen, and uh, I think there is something very uh, visceral and uh, poignant as a singer with a pianist, an art song, especially. We don't have sort of the costumes, we don't have the backdrops of opera or staged uh, stage works, I call it. So there is a there is a, a a really moment where we are channeling the poet and the composer. We are embodying those words. We are transmitting. We are sort of like the medium, right? And here we are. We're the vessel, and our voices are speaking those truths that are found in that text in song. I would just add exactly what Emery said. One of the things that is special about art song and different from opera is because there's no costume, we're already suspending disbelief. That's why crossing the color boundary and the barrier as singers is so possible in art song um, to an even greater extent than, than it can be in opera. Yeah, I don't, I don't exactly. I mean, I've, I've certainly sung a lot of crossing genres and and crossing lines gender and and even racially um, in, in margaret's bond songs and Florence Pleasant songs but it's because i so strongly identify with the displacement of that individual at mm. that time i also so strongly identify with the with the with the right of of a person in that position to have their soul heard and, and God knows that is one of the most powerful elements of the canon of African-American music, much less song, that I could possibly describe. You know, these are, these are souls of, of very deeply invested Americans that have not been treated like Americans. And, and, and the power of that reflection, I think, is quite, is quite huge. What do we have up here? We have Hall Johnson, Hall Johnson Mother to Son by Langston Hughes, Caroline and Carol, let's have a listen.
That's fantastic. Caroline, could you um, could you talk a little bit about this piece and, and performance? I mean, so Emery has in your class. He's uh, sort of done this research, invited um, white singers to take on African-American repertoire, and you start singing this. What was that like? Um, I am, have always sort of been accused of being uh, an, of an extremely optimistic person. <laughs> And I also really like people from all walks of life. I just find people fascinating. And so I didn't think about this. And again, this is from my own sort of Pollyanna background, which is also comes from a white privilege, place of white privilege, frankly. But I didn't think about that. I thought about this tired matriarch. I thought about my grandmother, frankly, and the way she could yank you up by the scruff of the neck and say, I've been doing this my entire life. Don't you fall now, because you've got to keep, you've got to keep this going. So I, I mean, I, it's a, a place of, of deep personal connection and it makes you, uh, if you understand that deep personal connection comes from the black voice as well as, you know, it makes you empathize with that person in that position. But it just seemed like a part of my own family, frankly. You know, last week we had uh, the great and stupendous uh, Bill Banfield, and he spoke of specifically an African-American tradition or canon, the experiencing of humanness. And humanness is timeless, and the humanness mm. is genderless, and the humanness is raceless, if you will. I, I, I'm trying to be very careful about that word anymore. Uh, but the point is, it, it's, a, it, it is, it's his experience of the humanness, and, he, and, he's, and he's very eloquent about that, that thrust of, of almost all of African American heritage is very, first of all, very musical and very much this evidence of, of, of humanness. And, and went on to, of course, spoke to your first points about gaining empathy and understanding. I mean, to me, that's what, when I read Langston Hughes poetry, I just, I mean, if there's just, if there's anything that jumps off the page, it's humanness. Henry, Henry, I see you, I see you, 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 you again agreeing, but expound, please. You guys, you guys have done so much research and so much project management on all of this and structuring. And I mean, what are your experiences as you're having these conversations with colleagues across the country and both teachers and 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 Black Americans and as well as white and and whatever nationalities are people are people getting what we're trying I, I to think, say? I think so. I mean, there's 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 some camps though. So uh, I know one of the things in in Carolina, I always address this as dialect. Yeah. So uh, that's a huge thing, as you know, in terms of concert spirituals and even in the art song that Caroline just sang, there was quite a bit of dialect. And so I know that a lot of singers, uh, including myself, I must add, I grew up in Boston. Uh, my folks are all from the South, Alabama, but I had to learn how to sing a spiritual. The first time I presented the spiritual for my voice teacher, they said I sounded like I was in diction class. It was so <laughs> perfect and almost like overly sort of white. That's what, she, that's what she, my teacher said. That was the whitest spiritual I've ever heard. Ah. <laughs> From a black person. So I, I, I get it. I mean, that we have to, no matter now. So Caroline grew up in where? In Galax, Virginia. So there you go. No, <laughs> no issue with dialect at all. Um, one of the other, go ahead. I'm sorry, that's how my people talk as well. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a huge thing. And, and so um, that's something that, you know, it's, it's part of like, it's part of the language of, of, so dialect, you have to just learn it like anything. And there are ways to sort of soften. So some people try so hard to uh, present dialect. And yeah. I always think about just sort of just softening everything up. Yeah. So not so plosive, 
with consonants? <laughs> I, I'd say just practice with a with a spoon of grits in your mouth. There we go. <laughs> you know, them, them, my folks come from uh, from Kansas and Missouri and Oklahoma, and so you know the when the first time I, I remember. <laughs> When I when I was with my Austrian wife, and the first time I had a conversation with my dad on the telephone, she had never met my father yet, you know. So dad is on the telephone, and he's asking me how I'm doing. I said, well, and he says, you know, how are you doing, son? I said, well, dad, pretty good. Yeah, we're all, well, I'm over here in Vienna now. And, I said, and as I started this conversation with my dad, just chopping everything up like that, you know, say, well, dad, what are you, are you home? You've been, well, you've been busy at work? But yeah, I can understand that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Andrea's eyes. <laughs> I was like, what is this person in my room? Uh, so you know, I think it's a it's a it's a valid point. I mean, certainly as a as a as a white American, when I've sung Grant Still songs and 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 have been encouraged to sing spirituals, I grew up singing spirituals because I grew up in a in a fundamentalist Seventh Day Adventist environment, evangelical, and you know, for them everything's fair game. Uh, if it if it's got a heart and it makes you cry and and say Jesus to the end, it's a it's a you've won. Uh, so you know I I just grew up and it all just seemed right to sing and it made sense at this step and we never thought of not a thing about it you know. So uh, but is it is it in 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 the, what I want to ask of course I want, I want to know what people react to it. You're, I'm glad you addressed this dialect thing, but is it for instance if 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 Stephen or I are going to sing a set of African-American songs, we want to have Steal Away in there, and we want to have, you know, we want to have Burley's arrangements, and we want to have Weldon Johnson, and we, you know, or something else, and we've got, and we've, oh, we've got a poem like this that's got the definite, you know, you have to, to understand Langston and what he's trying to say, uh, you know, d d are we allowed to use that dialect? I feel that, you know, in terms of, we've talked about this too, if we, we have to educate the audiences, because their perceptions are, only African Americans should enter the space, and this is this is another camp. I went to a predominantly uh, black campus and presented my work uh, with Caroline, and one of the students said to me, "It's like you know, basically, I'm going to say this, you know, that this is our music, and they've been taking everything that is ours, and they felt in terms of ownership, they wanted to preserve." that only African-Americans would inhabit songs and repertoire by African-American composers. Now, my feeling of that is that, you know, if we sort of keep it in sort of the small lens of performers, then we don't have as much out there for people to listen to and to, and to let people know about these composers. We still, we're still learning about them. Thanks to the Hampson Foundation and others, uh, African American Art Song Alliance, uh, V. Demus, uh, George Shirley. These are the places where the, the music's being heard and learned. Well, for fear of, of cringing, let's have a listen. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs>
that that song just one I, I love the three songs by Margaret Bonds. One of the remarkable things about that is that Margaret and Langston in that song are just right in the heart of the American classic song tradition. There's no dialect there. There's no, there's no threatening harmonies there. There's no jazzing around. The, the, the last song in the, in the triptych has a bit more of it. And, and maybe, the, and maybe the, um, the minstrel song or the minstrel boy, maybe, maybe that's there. But this song, you know, and of course, Margaret Bonds, what? She studied with Boulanger like everybody else did. And actually, Boulanger said, you're good to go. <laughs> and she went back home. And she was, of course, close friends with all the major white composers of the 30s and the 40s. And she was, you know, mentor to Ned Roram, which is, you know, the king of American classic song. So, you know, why, why don't we hear this song? You know, I, I, it's, I don't find it startling or particularly amazing to sing the words, I am, I am the darker brother. I am singing about the darker brothers and, and the idiocy of the world that they live in. In the same way, I could do probably something else from the, from the white the white tradition, as it were, uh, you know, I just, it didn't, it never crossed my mind that this would ever be or could be off-putting. It just seems it's a song, it's, it, it's wonderful songwriting. I'm, I'm a big fan of Margaret Bonds, and I think Louise Taupin is, is so exciting, and she's got this new album coming out, and I mean, it's just incredible stuff, and people need to know Margaret Bonds. Oh, you know, boom, fantastic, we're done. So and I think this is an incredible text too, really powerful. Oh my God! And in in conversation with another poet who uh, you've you've sung Walt Whitman, right? Yeah, I mean it's you know, but I mean Langston Hughes. What do you want? You know, he's the... yeah. I've, I mean, I've always heard this as a kind of reply to Langston Hughes. You know, I hear America singing, where where Hughes is calling out and saying, "I'm here as well." Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see what and you mean. So, I, I mean I... so it's. Uh, there's there's a way in which there's a kind of cross there's there's a white black dialogue going on here in this text that's opening up the definition of what America is in in a similar to way you know that, that the Hamsong workshops and Emory and Caroline's research is is trying to open up and create that empathetic space. You know, there's that wonderful picture of 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 a relatively young Whitman. On the on the on the boardwalk, and he's kind of got one hip stuck out, and he's got his hat kind of tipped, you know. And he's just kind of he just he just there. He's just taking it all in. He's so present at that moment. And I want to superimpose the other side of of that wonderful picture of Langston. It somewhat the same, you know, really well dressed and immaculate. And he's got that gleam in his eye, a little bit of it, a little bit of alpha tip. I like to put them next together. You can just imagine them having their arms on each other's shoulders and just and just walking down and saying. Boy, these people just don't get it, do they? <laughs> you know, I just, I, I, I just find them so wonderfully in communication with each other. Let, where are we, where are we going from here, please, Caroline? I, what I wanted to uh, sort of riff on now was the one of the most important parts of what Emery and I do is that we go into colleges and universities and we work with. The faculty there, we, we present a, a, a lecture recital in which we talk about the history of African American composers and African American art songs, beginning with spirituals. It's a really powerful opening. Uh, Emory mm -hmm. sings an unaccompanied spiritual off stage in the dark, and it is, and with his gorgeous voice, which you'll get to hear later. It's, it's just a really chilling experience. And then, uh, and then we go in and talk about the whole um, uh, history of things, but interspersed with Emory and me singing songs uh, by African-American composers, but also faculty from the college that we're at singing songs as well, providing a local example for those students. And we always work with pianists from the school. And so we come in and sort of infect them, shall we say, with this knowledge or, to, uh, you know, help give them some ground basis of knowledge and then uh, provide an example for the local community. And then when we leave, hopefully that sets up the, the, the ability for the, the local teachers to walk the walk the rest of the way. Um, and so with that and discussion sections and master classes and everything, we, we try to get the whole community involved. Wonderful. And I have to say that that model 
is so powerful because it's not only engaging in so many different ways, engaging through obviously the performances, but of black, white, uh, faculty, guests, students, you know, in master classes, but it's also engaging through through really useful conversations. And without that coming together, it's it would be very hard to have these great conversations. If it was just, you know, Caroline and Emory coming in and saying, here, y'all need to learn this and just singing at us or just talking at us, but instead there's this really coming together and then that provides the space for these conversations to happen. Mm -hmm. Can you Kaswana, talk do you think, okay, sorry, I want to ask what, Kaswana, do you think that people, do you think, do you think our general public, which is already a tender subject when it comes to recitals and, and as your generation is moving forward, I, I just applaud you loving opera and song and being so passionate about song. But can you imagine that our that our that our our public wants to take this journey with us? That they actually they that they're going to accept what we're talking about here tonight as not as not some kind of cultural appropriation. That they're actually going to say, "Okay, she she's going to sing that." In the same way that you might be you you might sing something that is sort of arch white, as it were, and then somebody else sings something that's arch black. What do you think our public is going to do with all this? I honestly think that audiences are thirsting for uh, experiences that challenge them. Um, and I think it, it's necessary at this point, um, with especially with the whole situation of like COVID and, and just things, um, even with opera companies trying to find ways to re-engage um, audiences but you keep kind of feeding them the same Verdi, the same um, uh, uh, Puccini, the, just these same works that are they're great and they will always be staples in, in, in the business. And those are things that are always good to hear. But as you're trying to connect the younger generation in, they want something that's more, um, doesn't like they want, subject matter that doesn't seem as aloft as some of the works that um, we keep pushing. Um, so to, and you can kind of tell that kind of across, like if you look at um, musical theater and some of the new plays that come out, like they're always about like some type of subject matter that so like a social issue of the time, reflecting the time. Right. And I think yeah. opera really, needs to have um, a big kind of coming together and understand that this is how we grow. This is how we evolve the art form and take it from being like a bourgeoisie thing to something that everyone can, can be a part of. You know, I very often, I very often encourage people to understand that we have no dearth of younger generation artists. We have so many wonderful young singers and you know i'm old enough that i've got a couple of your generations behind me there's never a lack of of people like you that want to do this what seems to be hanging up today is a lack of young audiences and yeah. and i can't help but feel the programming and the presentation that, you know that we're just we're going right by them we're talking over them around them underneath them you know maybe maybe we i, I mean yeah. It's hard, to, it's hard to, some of the stylization that we so love because it, it actually takes care of some of the stuff, mm -hmm. puts other people off. What do you think? Should I, we talk I, to our audiences more? I think we should talk to audiences more. I, um, I also think that you're right in saying that it does, like people kind of go around the issue. And I will even say that it's not even really about the audience. I will say it's more about the donors. Um, a lot of opera houses are really, really concerned about what the, like their donors, but they don't understand that, uh, hopefully not, not to be um, rude, but the donors are kind of older in age and they're starting to age out. And so, so. Um, do, you, do you know the phrase tail wagging the dog? <laughs> yes. And, and so <laughs> similar to kind of like, um, so I will say that in order to kind of um, grow a new 
set of donors. Sometimes it, it's not about like trying to pick people who have the most money. Sometimes it's about um, trying to amass a lot of people who have a little bit of money. You know, so, as we're seeing like initiatives like crowdfunding and things, sometimes you're seeing that a small person's five dollars can get you sometimes way farther than that million dollar donation will. And I feel like if you take that concept when it comes to um, arts administration um, and uh, programming around that concept and around challenging the people. So like when they go home, they're not thinking they're, yes, they're thinking about, oh, how well that person's saying, but they're thinking about, oh my gosh, like what if I was in that situation of that character? What would I be thinking? It leaves them home thinking they'll come back. You know, and, and I think I, I just I just got this flash flashing idea of crowdfunding programming. I find that that's a wonder, wonderful idea. I mean, that, 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 you know, people say what they want to hear. And they say, that, you know, your, your point is extremely well taken. I don't mean to interrupt you because your point is well taken about about donors and the structure. And God knows that the philanthropic power of in america is overwhelming and the mm -hmm. generosity is staggering mm -hmm. and the numbers are are beyond belief and and you really they make you kind of dizzy when you when you realize what some of these organizations have to do every season to stay alive mm -hmm. um you know when w w nea and nah are sort of hobby platforms that the government feels obligated to do and they've missed the point of what they should be able to do in my opinion for a long time. So we do live at the behest of generosity. Um, I, I think what, what I'm going with this is that to take your suggestion on is if we're going to have that, then I think every opportunity we can possibly have to, to bring this generous body of people who may be generously giving money because they think this, and actually we want them to think that, right. we, need to, we need to get them in a room. We right. need to sing more dinners for them and, and have a have a conversation. I, and I think also wanted to say is it apropos crowdfunding and and you know this sort of the third rail thought. This is the world we're heading into. We're not going back. What what we had as a performance world, especially in America, in, in December, will not exist again. And if it does in any kind of form, it'll be a long time away. So these kinds of thoughts that you're that you're offering tonight especially from your generation, enlightening ours and how we can, is, is wonderful. That's exactly what we need to be, exactly what we need to be concentrating on. Mm -hmm. Stephen, I see you agreeing like crazy. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> no, I see you not. I, I, this is all true. Oh, go, 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 team, go. Mark. <laughs> well, one of the what encouraging about things is, uh, so Anthony this uh just one of the surprises excuse me isn't that aren't those the five gentlemen that our president said were guilty no matter what the court decided oh i'm sorry i didn't mean to digress beg your pardon and then um that's a showstopper right there <laughs> <laughs> yes but you know he did the um opera x life and times of malcolm x uh opera on the amistad uh trial um you know with famous uh slave case in the 1830s so that you know really a history of bringing contemporary issues through the lens of opera. And opera seems to me uniquely powerful in the ability to, to illustrate those lives and feelings and that emotion on stage. I mean, to get beyond the stereotypes and into these, these putting human stories on, on the stage. And, you know, we just, we need to be really thinking about that repertoire and opening up the doors. So I'm, I'm, I'm hundred percent behind Koswana's comments. Well, I'm Where are you that we could sell this, uh, sell art song is that it's, it's so weird, it's cool, you know, <laughs> and that, you know, it's low tech, it takes one singer, one pianist, and great music and text, and uh, it is, un, it is the exact, the polar opposite of the extreme spectacle of, say, the Super Bowl halftime show. You know, um, so the opportunity, you know, here we are in Zoom times, mm -hmm. the opportunity for intimacy and one-to-one and -one communication is, I think, just, it's, the times are ripe for this. Yeah. I, I just want to, when you, when you're looking at classical class song repertoire, you know, whether it's black or white or whatever else, but I mean, in, in this genre, do you, do you find yourself saying, wait a minute, that, that just sounds like, 
that sounds like the same message from this wonderful R&B song or, or hip hop, because I mean, you were saying you know this music so well and it's part of your life. Do you, do you feel that sort of humanness that is, that is totally crossed to genre? Yes. Um, I can't, Go for it. I can't tell you how many times Dr. Taufman has tried to get my voice to move and it's in a lesson and it hasn't. And then she's <laughs> like, pretend you're Whitney Houston doing this run and I'm able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I like I literally have to like take sometimes just take concepts or emotional feelings that I get from singing like my favorite like 1970s or 1980s R&B song and I'll sing like that one phrase and then try to transfer that into singing um, maybe a Wagner piece you know and I'm able to to get the line that I want and so it's kind of like a transference of concepts and feelings um, and a, just bridging that, that gap. And, and it just helps to, honestly, like sometimes when I'm, I'm I, I guess you could say, when I'm assigned vegetables or songs that I don't necessarily like at first, I connecting and be like, oh, I do like this part. And then I start, it starts to grow on me. Um, so yes, definitely bridging that. And I also, um, times when I find like a lot of my compatriots in, in music use that connection that they have with their, with gospel R&B to, as a way to um, kind of take a break from the box that they tend to be in when they're singing opera or classical music. Um, and they go back to those more contemporary genres because even though there's structure there, the lid is off. Like there's, there's so many possibilities and, and you're encouraged to explore those possibilities because of just the core of that music. Whereas like opera hasn't gotten to that part, that, that level yet. Um, yeah. And so we're hoping that with the integration of you know, new works possessing like new, um, new techniques such as like spoken word or rap or, you know, within um, art song, within um, opera, that, that, that lid will slowly start to come off and expand. Could you imagine a recital, you doing a recital that's got some Schubert and some foray on it and some R&B? Oh, I love it. I, I, I remember my master's recital. Um, I actually did a set called the New Orleans Suite by Needy Shanty. And she's a native uh, female composer from uh, New Orleans. And her, she, she literally says in the foreword, like this is for a classical artist who loves like R&B. And you can kind of see like she has some R&B concepts interwoven within the art the, the cycle to the point where there's like songs where it's it's just the piano riffing. The singer is not doing anything. So I was able to mm -hmm. go off stage, take a break while my pianos <laughs> had their moment. And then I have come back. Come yeah, have, you know, just like chug and be like, okay. And then <laughs> have my moment and then come back on the stage. And it was so much fun. It was but so- But seriously, fun. you know, you, uh, you, you all know Julia Bullock, right? You know, I, I'm, I, she, I just love this girl. She's a fantastic young soprano, mixed heritage, uh, and has done this wonderful, we all know her, right? So she's got this recital, and she literally gets from Schubert to Nina Simone in oh. one evening. And I can tell you, you know, I have been threatening for years to do a recital called Heinrich Heine to Merle Haggard. <laughs> and, and, and maybe I'm just going to get it together enough. I've been listening to Merle a lot lately. Uh, I mean, it is about, I want to say it right, it is about what Bill said, Banfield, experiencing the humanness. Mm. I just love that. And we're talking about humanness experienced, the, the beauty of these sort of hybrid programs is you're experiencing it um, in the uniqueness of the individual, right? If you love this music and that music, then you're uniquely positioned to put that together. But at the same time, because you're going across genres, you're including more humanity and human perspective and more art. Mm -hmm. So it's this beautiful mix of things. Um, 
that touches us. Well, please, Emery. No, I just want to add to that uh, uh, with Stephen's comment is that we've been doing the same thing for years through the academy, meaning sort of universities and the canon, and the canon has been stuck. <laughs> and we need to unleash it. We need to let it go. We need to do those uh, sort of hybrid programs, Thomas and, and Kiswana, uh, mm -hmm. because I think that our audiences also, we're trying to rebuild them. We, we, you know, we have these uh, audiences who have never been to a classical recital. So what's one way to reprogram or redesign what we've been doing for eons? Good for you. A little bit of music before we go. We've got, we've got a Mr. Emery Stevens singing a John W. Work song. And Catherine's back at the piano. <laughs> Wonderful. Tell me about Mr. Work. Well, very interesting. He came from a uh, very musical family. And his grandfather uh, was a musician. His father was a musician and also was a professor at Fisk University. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you could tell. I mean, just his writing is uh, just in terms of the setting of this little light of mine, which is such a democratic statement. There's a personal responsibility here. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to commit to the work. Um, and I think that's a wonderful statement in itself. It's very simple. I mean, it's very simple sort of hymn-like setting. But I grew up singing in the chorus. Right. You, you, you want to share that, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the verses is... <laughs> 
uh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it a bushel. I, I know, a bushel, no. Well, we thought we were very clever at 12 and 13. So we would just change the agogic a little and it would turn into a, hide it under a bush. Hell no, I'm going to let it shine. We felt very clever in Sunday school, actually, in my case, Saturday school, Sabbath, it was the Seventh day Adventist, you know. Hide it under a bush. Hell no, I'm going to let it shine. We get this sort of glint from the teacher, like, what? What? You know, we thought we were so clever. Never mind. I, I, I hesitate to have told that because we were in such a wonderful place with that wonderful statement. It's like, uh, it's like the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where you ought to be and let your little light shine. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we have much more to say than that. Experiencing humanity together, let our lights shine, sing our songs, and sing those damn barriers down. <laughs> Thank yes. you very much for being here tonight. <laughs> we're having fun. Art of Democracy. Uh, we're putting together a, a little July 4 program for you. Uh, we hope you will like. Uh, you can find it on our various Facebook pages. Uh, pages. We wish you the best. We will be carrying on with this. Uh, we'll do another series. Uh, the summer will probably take a, a pause, but we will be doing more series like this with more guests, exploring all the possible ways we can make songs resonate so we understand ourselves as Americans better. I guess that's what e pluribus unum might mean. Do you think? Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thank Stephen. You. Aswana. Thank you. Caroline Emery. Thank you.